Hey guys and welcome back to the channel. Today I'm joined by Anime, a fellow friend and medic at Cambridge, and today we'll be talking about research and all the things that you've been up to as a medical student and as a researcher practically. Thank you for having yourself. me, Sam. It's so no. good to be here. Finally to be here on St. Thorncast's channel. I've been watching you for literally months now, <laughs> waiting <laughs> for me to be on. I think I did I have a cameo when I you... think you came in the vlog once, but it was very brief um... <laughs> You've enticed the fans and now they're gonna see me in person. <laughs> Right, so, anyway, tell us about yourself. Which college are you at? Um, what is the college like? And then we'll talk about research. So, um, hi, I'm Anime. I'm a third year medical student at Pete House. Um, I'm a medic engineer. So in my part two, I'm doing engineering, just like Sam. Um, Pete House, um, it's a really lovely college. It's the oldest college in the university. It's also one of the smallest. So we only have about 80. When you say it's the oldest, is it like 600 years old or? Oh gosh, I think it's older. So um, fun, it's like fun fact about the college is that we have the Second oldest still standing uh, building in Europe used for its original purpose. That is secular. Oh, wow. uh, that's some um, great hall, which you'll have seen. Pete House. Yeah, Pete House is wow. Great hall. Um, it sort of feels very Harry Potter ish. And yeah. also, we're the second building in the UK to have electricity after the House of Parliament. So, fun this fact is, about Pete House. This is crazy. <laughs> right, again, okay, Pete House is also quite central, right? It's close to the um, sort of the humanities department, close to the medicine department, close to engineering. Oh, you you practically walk out the back door. Oh, it's amazing. So, uh, <laughs> like whenever um, whenever I need to go from engineering, I literally have about thirty second walk from my from the engineering department to my room. But it's also really great for medicine. Um, yeah. So Downing site where we have the preclinical lectures are only about a minute away. Mm. Um, any sort of natural sciences stuff is all on Downing site. So closer than Jesus. Oh no, absolutely. And we're really lucky to have a really central location. So mm. like getting into town is really easy. Um, but also we're like not like kings or something, so we're right. not going to be like mobbed by tourists during the day. Um, so it's quite quiet and it's quite nice. I think and for kings, they even ask you to show you a card, even if you're yeah, a student. Really. Just again. So yeah, Jesus is also sort of, it's not central, but it's not as central mm. as Peterhouse. Then again, I think Cambridge is a very weird city, isn't it? It's Depending so on, odd, yeah. Like, central can be like one minute from lecture theatres, but also like five minutes away like I am. And like what's considered outside is when you're like ten minutes or more from. Yeah, there's like people are saying, "Oh God, it's such a tragedy. I have to walk five minutes to uh, to, to Mainsbury's or something." <laughs> it's not really that far. Mainsbury's is like the big shopping, uh, big shopping centre that we all go to. Right, Peter House. Then, if someone was applying, what what are the like few exciting things they can look forward oh, to? <laughs> um, so I think we're lucky that we're sort of like uh, we've got quite we were quite lucky a couple of years ago to have quite a big endowment, so we've mm. quite a lot of money to sort of spend on the students. Uh, <laughs> um, it's like a really it's it's a very because it's um, I don't know if I've said it's the smallest college. Sure. So we have about eighty undergraduates. Eighty. Eighty. We have one hundred and forty. Yeah, so it's like eighty yeah. eighty every single year. That's really good. It's um, a very small knit community. Absolutely, um, and we have about se six or seven medical students. Mm. In case you're not applied to Peter House. You know, in case you're not already persuaded, we also have every single potato option you can possibly conceive of during lunch. No, we have lattice fries, we have spiral fries, we have parmentier, we have what? roast potatoes, we have like boiled jacket potatoes, potatoes well. we, have, we have jacket potatoes, we have mashed potatoes. Here at Jesus, French fries and chunky <laughs> chips are like two, three times a week. It is a luxury. <laughs> oh, we don't, we, don't, we have, we have like normal French fries, we have roast, we have oh, French no, fries, we have triple cooked okay. chips, it's... Yeah. I think when you're studying this hard, you need the carbs and the fats. Oh, absolutely. I am about 10 to 20 percent starch at this point, I'm pretty sure. <laughs> oh, God, no, the weirdest thing we had was a sort of block of mozzarella. Oh, no. Oh, yeah, I think you said it. Yes, yes, yes. It's yeah. like a huge block or something. And, like, it's, like, it's, it's like this big, guys. It's like, it's like a block of mozzarella. It's completely breaded. It's, it's a bit of a monstrosity. Was it good, though? Oh, God, no, delicious. Yeah. <laughs> oh, wow. It's like having those cheesy <laughs> things from McDonald's, you know, the cheesy exactly, steak, yeah. but on a massive scale. Yeah. Student size. So, Peter House over, anime's been introduced. Thank you so much once again. Yeah. So, let's talk more about research, because I know for, as a medical student in particular, you have a very deep interest in medical research, particularly academic research. Mm -hmm. And a lot of you are interested in research, particularly those of you applying to Cambridge. But I guess it's an interesting field, because there isn't much information about what it's like doing research. The... Um, the challenges, but also the benefits and your experiences of it, I think, will be quite insightful. Um, so, could you, in summary, sort of tell us what you've done since coming to Cambridge in terms of research, what placements you've done, and where around the world you've been doing research? So, um, when I, yeah, so when I first came to Cambridge, I was already quite interested in research, and sort of my research interests are actually sort of um, a bit more mathsy than I think the average medical student is, or well, mm. did engineering. Yeah. Um, so in first year, we have a course called the Introduction to the Scientific Basis of Medicine, 
um, which sort of is a bit misnomered because it's all about epidemiology and medical statistics. Mm -hmm. um, and so I was, um, I was, I was really interested in that kind of stuff before coming here to the university. And so I just sent an email to the uh, lecturer, which is Professor Paul Farrow, who works down at Strangeways near the hospital. Um, and I emailed him saying, you know, is it possible I could have, you know, work out, work with you over the summer? I was fully expecting to get just like rejected because mm. I know like getting so busy and yeah, and getting research placements so hard. And there's so many students, but like I was really lucky. And then he said like, yeah, no, sure, please come along. Like, ha let's have a chat. So you're so proactive. You went for it because you're interested. And in yeah, no, no, absolutely. And like I think that was quite good. Um, and also like the fact that the work, the, sort of the field I do work in, sort of epidemiology and statistics, mm. doesn't have many medical students coming to it right. as an undergraduate. So I was quite lucky that I didn't have much competition in that field. Mm. Um, so I was quite lucky in that regard. Um, and also I was really lucky to you know, go to a college like Peterhouse because they have like a study grant scheme. So I was able to get money for my accommodation. Oh, so that makes it so much more cost effective. Oh no, absolutely. Because I guess going to places and staying in the holidays and even Cambridge is very expensive. So that's all covered by the colleges. Yeah, So um, and colleges usually offer, I think, subsidised accommodation over the summer. So mm. um, it, I think at Pete House is like 15 15 a night um, for like a room in college. That's which, pretty good. Yeah. So it's comfortable, you're used to it as well, so it's just get on with the research practically. Absolutely, and you know, if you try and take any other sort of like room out in Cambridge, especially with like house prices now, this is going to be ridiculous. It's so like 600, 700 pounds a month at least for a small one bedroom. Like Absolutely. Apartment. So if you, you know, if you go to Cambridge, then you're really lucky that um, the college system can really help you out in terms mm. of getting accommodation and funding if you need to be here over the summer doing research. Fantastic. And then last year you were at, I think you were in Boston at the Broad Institute or no? So I was working, oh, this so the problem is like <laughs> everywhere. Let's simplify it. <laughs> Every, everywhere, everywhere in uh, uh, Boston is sort of like interrelated with each other. So, oh, like, there's the Harvard, MIT, and yeah, there's like yeah. loads of different universities. Yeah, so I was specifically working, uh, the building I was working in was the uh, Dana Farber Cancer Institute. Hmm. Um, I think that's meant to be one of the best in the world, right? For cancer. No. Oh, well. <laughs> I, 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 I have absolutely no like, claim to that whatsoever. So, other people's yeah. work. Um, okay, sure. But um, yeah. I don't know whether you read um, Siddharth Mukherjee's book, The yes. Informalities. Yes, so, the crowd. The yes, the crowd. Yes, yes, yes. Um, so his first half of the book is actually all about the guy, father, Sydney father. Mm, and okay. so when I went there, I was sort of like, oh my goodness, I'm in the building that I read about. Oh, you read about? How exciting. So there I was doing a lot of the same kind of work that I was doing with Professor Farrow here in mm. Cambridge. Mm. So I was still working on this kind of genetic epidemiology work. Sure. But whilst before I was looking more at these things called polygenic risk schools um, in sort of the first, second year summer, mm. in the summer I was in Boston, I was doing work on genetic epidemiology. And so basically what we were doing was we were looking at um, GWAS mutations. Right. And we're trying to say, how do those mutations actually cause disease? So what are the promoters and enhancers that they're hitting? What are the genes that they then go on and interact? How do those genes then cause disease? And specifically right. for prostate cancer. And that's, that's a huge was. thing nowadays. Especially amongst men. Men yeah. only have prostates. But I think age of 50 is when sort of prostate uh, cancer rates peak, right? Absolutely, yeah. And like, you know, it's like such a huge burden. Uh, even though the mortality rates are lower than perhaps for other cancers, like mm. it's such a high like instance rate. Yeah. Um, you know, at most men, like when you get older, are going to be affected by some amount of, you know, prostate hypertrophy or prostate cancer. Hypertrophy meaning sort of the bigger growth or something. Yeah. Right. Gets big. And also, if someone didn't know the definition of epidemiology, very quickly, how would you define oh, it? Oh, goodness. Um, very I... simple one sentence definition. <laughs> <laughs> Otherwise, I'll be sitting there wondering, what <laughs> does epidemiology mean? No, no, I'm sorry, sorry, I should have defined that. Um, epidemiology is kind um, sort of population health, basically. So that goes all the way from sort of doing um, sort of more surveys and stuff mm. of, you know, um, sort of dietary stuff. So, you know, what people are eating, what are the effects of smoking, what mm. effects of sort of taking vegetables, right. all the way to stuff like um, genome wide association studies. So looking at mutations people have and saying, I know this mutation will increase your risk of getting heart disease or something. So mm. it's a really broad field. Sure. And so, OK, so you were in Cambridge after the first year. Mm -hmm. You were in America uh, on the East Coast in the second year. I think you're in the, on the West Coast this year. Yeah, I'm using I'm using my research places to go on as much holiday as possible. It's really good, though, right? <laughs> because because like seriously, like if you're traveling to places and getting academic um, benefits out of it, it's like a two in one sort of thing. No, it's incredible. Like, I got to go to um, Boston um, when I was there. I went mm. to New York as well. So I never got to go there, and like, especially um, you know, it's you know. When you get to clinical school, the turn times get even shorter. Oh, gosh, so. four week holidays, and yeah. you actually need four weeks to relax as opposed to Absolutely. travel. Mm. Yeah. So it's it's really good to like try and go abroad and like do these kinds of things because then you can like mix it like academic work with then going to you know see all these great places. Mm. Fantastic. Okay, so now you guys know more about sort of the actual research work. Can we talk more about research in general? Um, what are the benefits do you think as a medical student of getting involved? Um, in this level of research. Of course, you can do some projects in the summer yeah. or here and there. 
but you're doing it to a far deeper extent. For your career ambitions, how will it help you? So, um, when I was younger, I kind of wanted to... I, I always was interested in academic work, mm. uh, but I was always really interested in being a doctor. Mm. But one thing that really worried me was I thought, you know, you had to be one. And so I thought, you know, I'd have to come to medical school, I have to say, you know, oh, I just want to be a clinician. I only want to do clinical work. Clinician meaning like one working in a hospital for yeah. the whole life. Right. Um, and then sort of secretly at the end of six years, I'll sort of switch and be like, ah, actually, I also want to do some academic work as well. And I didn't know there was a really sort of set out pathway. Mm. Uh, but then when I was getting, when I was just beginning to apply in sort of um, year 13, mm. um, I figured out there was this career pathway for this thing called the clinician academic, which is where you could do clinical work and academic work. And it was like really great to see that you that they thought you could do both. Mm. And that like there was a whole pathway and they had thought it out and they thought that like medical students and doctors would appreciate and that some of them would really want to do academic work along with clinical work. Um, and so, you know, I've always kept that in mind, which is why I do, like, more research work probably than anyone else. Uh, so other, like, medical students, mm, of course. Mm, mm. And also, the kind of research work I do in terms of maths and statistics is also sort of a bit out there and, like... It's very it's, relevant. And it's also very... It's a fast-changing field. But it's a, it's a fast-growing field as well. We're giving you lots of potential for papers and... Yeah. No, it's absolutely... And, like, and one of the great things about doing sort of dry lab work, um, mm. it's called, um, and doing computation... So dry lab is when you're sort of working more with stats. Yeah. And wet lab is when you're more with the pets and cells and... Absolutely. Yeah, so wet lab stuff is like traditionally what you'll probably consider to be research. So, you know, you're working around with pipettes, you know, you have cell cultures, you have like a nice lab coat, you look very professional. Uh, mean, uh, sort of dry lab work. Dry lab work can be, you know, working in sort of like an office like right. I was. Just on the computer, yeah. smashing things away, analyzing things, running tests. Yeah. And all of or, you know, working at sort of 11 p.m. in your pajamas. Uh, <laughs> so you, know, you can do stuff like you can work from home, you're much more flexible. Mm. Um, you have much like, I think, quicker sort of work time because you're not waiting on cell cultures. It's right. much more reliable. It's all depending on how fast you can work and how you manage your time. Yeah, yeah. Now, I want to ask you also, so a lot of the people watching are interested in publications, so you're doing lots of research. Is it sort of easy to get publications as a medical student? Because people think you have to become a professor, you have to become a very established person to start getting your name on papers, like scientific papers. Is it easier if you are proactive? Yeah, so if you're proactive, then it's a lot easier. And, like, it's... I think getting, like, first order publications is quite hard. Mm. First author meaning... When you ever see a published paper, you'll see um, there's like an author list mm. and, you know, first author, for example, is the first author that's listed and generally denotes the person who like led a lot of the research work. Other conventions are that the last person is like the professor of the lab. Right. Um, and then sort of in between... But then also there's often, especially in these modern scientific publications, there's loads of people on the author list. Mm. And it's quite common after doing some kind of project and that project goes well, that you'll then get put onto that author list mm. um, somewhere in that. And that will contribute towards your publication count for foundation school applications oh, yes, anyway. Yes, yes, yes. Um, and so, so another reason why you might want to come to Cambridge is that we have the sort of part two. Mm. And so, yeah, we've done engineering, um, but most of the other medics do natural sciences. Right. And so they'll do sort of an extended research project. To help them get publications, to really help them understand what is research like and how do I get good at research. Yeah, no, absolutely. Yeah. And, you know, some of them will be lucky enough to then get that kind of thing published and their names will be on that author list. And, you know, they'll have contributed to like a real scientific project out in the real world if they're lucky. So Instead of ones in sort of chemistry or biology <laughs> where you stand there. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, in, yeah. Oh, instead of the sort of the projects you do during sort of first second year, which is you know you do like you know Western blot, and you're like, oh great, I did a Western blot, fantastic. But not... nothing came out of it. Exactly. Sure. So, right. So if you want publications, it is possible as a medical student. You just have to go for the research placements, make sure you're committed. And would you say just to end this video and to wrap it up, let's say someone does get a research placement, and they're going to a first of a sort of six to eight week um, length research placement. Mm -hmm. What are the key things that they should keep in mind to give off the best impressions? Give off the best impressions? Especially in research. Um, oh gosh, that's a hard question. Um, I think the first impressions are really actually made before you reach there. Hmm. Um, sorry, I'm telling you a question. I, that. I think the first impressions are really made before you get there and sort of the way you introduce yourself to them. You know, how, And like you, shouldn't, you should be like confident in who you are. Like you are, like hopefully you'll be a medical student or some kind of student. Um, you know, you'll have skills and you should really be forward about that and sort of let them know like what you can do and what they can like help you to do. Mm. You know, so what project. you can offer them and what they can do. Exactly, yeah. yeah. Like, I mean, you're, you're going over there to do like some work for them. And like you shouldn't feel that like you're just a burden, you know. You should feel like, oh, I'm going to go over and do some work for them. I'm going to get something from it. They're going to get something from me. Mm, it's a mutual like, relationship. Exactly, a mutual mm. partnership. Um, and then when you're over there, like it's important to like obviously you know work hard. You know, always make sure you're talking to someone in the group. You know, never feel that like you have to work sort of quietly by yourself and that like, you can't ask someone for help. 
Um, that may not be sort of your uh, main professor because mm -hmm. they might be very busy, but make sure there's like a PhD student in the lab or a postdoctoral student in the lab. Just to keep the relationship and sort of to ask any questions you have early to avoid making a mistake, a systematic mistake throughout everything. Absolutely. And then realizing Actually, again. that's a really good point. Um, if you, like, never feel, like, bad if you make a mistake. I've made so many mistakes on my research projects. Um, and, like, coding is particularly depressing because, you know, you'll generate some analysis and the professor will be like, oh, have you thought about this? And you know, like, everything falls apart. <laughs> uh, then you sort of end up, you get, like, a splitting migraine and you're like, oh, God, what's going wrong? But it's important to get that stuff out of the way early yeah. so that if it ever does then develop into something, you know, it's more robust. Right. You've gained something from it because you've understood something now so you know never worry about getting something wrong and like if you have a good professor which mm. hopefully you will like they'll completely understand it and they'll be more than happy to help out so okay. always be honest so make sure that you're ready before you even go there but also when you're there ask questions and don't be afraid to make mistakes. yes be keen be enthusiastic like really try and aim for things like publication trying to do as much independent work as possible because then like that's how you grow more as a researcher mm. um, over there um, but yeah don't and then don't feel you need to spend like every hour waking hour of the day like they're not gonna they're not gonna expect you to. What like if you don't finish the project? What would let's say the work ends up being a lot more than you expected? Mm -hmm. What what's the best thing to do in that case? If you feel like it can develop into something like that can get your name on a paper, mm. or you can feel like, oh, there's something I really I want to finish this to improve to improve like some of my understanding. So let's say there's some analysis you want to do statistically and you're like, I really want to crack at this analysis, then feel free to finish it. But like you shouldn't feel pressured into going beyond that deadline. You know, if you've sort of come to natural completion or you've come to the end of it, like university is hard. Like you've got a lot of stuff to do during the year. You don't want to have to spend that time it's... doing a research project if you don't want to. Right. Okay. But if you want to and you can get a paper out of it or you can develop some kind Switch of skill, for a bit more. And yeah, absolutely. That. And like let them know that like you're going to be in university. Like they'll be absolutely fine with the fact that like you're going to be busy and you can reduce the amount of work you're doing. Well, hopefully that was very useful. Anime, thank you so thank, much. Thank you for having me again. And I think this is probably the most research-oriented video <laughs> yet on my channel. If you have any questions, do comment down below. Anime, you can sort of answer if you can, or yeah, pass or anything that I can answer. And as always, thank you so much for watching, guys. And we'll see you soon in the next video. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.